All right, well, welcome, welcome everyone. My name is Mariana and I am a park interpreter specialist and I'm so excited to be here with you all to hear about this awesome presentation about uh, grizzlies from Peter. Just wanna give a really quick shout out uh, to Tom and Mary Kay Eltsroth as the underwriters of the Mind Walk series. This is an awesome opportunity to listen to some amazing speakers and really get to know different resources, both the natural and cultural resources of our area in San Luis Obispo Coast District, but just anywhere. Um, Peter, who is our guest speaker today, he is a professor in the Environmental Studies Program at UC Santa Barbara and founder of the California Grizzly Research Network. So welcome, Peter. Super excited to have you here. Uh, just going to go over your quick description. So you're all here to hear about our bear, bear essential, the past and potential future of grizzlies in California. On the eve of the gold rush, California contained an estimated 10,000 grizzly bears, one grizzly for every 11 people and one fifth of all the grizzlies in the contiguous United States at the time. By 1925, California's grizzlies were gone. What made California such a great grizzly habitat? What drove North America's largest terrestrial omnivore to extinction in our state? And could grizzlies ever be brought back? I'm excited. So Peter, it's all you. Thank you so much, Mariana. And thank you to Kristen and everyone at State Parks for organizing this event and also to the underwriters who are, who are supporting it. It's wonderful to be with you today and to talk about uh, for an hour here to talk about a topic that to be perfectly honest, I could talk about for days. So today I wanna to tell you a little bit about the research that I've been involved with for about the past five years. Uh, based at UC Santa Barbara, but involving um, a large and expanding network uh, of students and colleagues and other participants uh, from around the state of California and beyond, taking really a fresh look for the first time in, in decades, in really over six decades, uh, at the past and potential future of grizzly bears in California. All right, so I want to start off by just talking a little bit about grizzly bears themselves. There we go. So grizzly bears are one of eight currently existing uh, bear species that are currently uh, alive today. There were obviously uh, a larger number of bear species in the past during the Pleistocene, some of which have gone extinct uh, in the years since. The eight currently existing species of bear that we have in the world today are uh, grizzly bears, which are also known as brown bears throughout much of their range. Uh, in North America, Europe, and Asia. But there are also uh, Asian or Asi Asiatic black bears, sun bears, sloth bears, American black bears, which are the most numerous of all the eight bear species, spectacled bears, panda bears, and polar bears. Polar bears are the cl most closely related uh, of all the currently existing bear species to brown or grizzly bears. And as a matter of fact, female polar bears and male grizzly bears or brown bears can mate and produce fertile offspring we now know in the wild. So they are quite closely related. One way to think about the relationship between them is that whereas brown or grizzly bears are often generalists that can live in a wide variety of different kinds of habitats and do a lot of different kinds of things, polar bears are much more specialized hunters. Brown bears are more omnivorous and polar bears are more carnivorous. Although as we'll see a little bit later, their habits can change depending on where they are and when exactly we're talking about. So if you look worldwide at brown bears, Ursus arctos, which we call grizzlies throughout much of North America, there are 15 uh, subspecies that are currently recognized of brown bears worldwide. Three of these are considered extinct, and then the rest uh, still exist throughout all or part of their historic range. The three currently uh, extinct brown bear subspecies are the California grizzly, uh, the um, Mexican grizzly bear, uh, and then the Atlas bear actually, which, is, uh, which uh, was native to North Africa. If we look here though on the right side of the image that you're seeing in front of you now, uh, that is actually based on genetic studies that have been done over the past few decades, as opposed to the subspecies designations, which are really based on measurements taken of uh, specimens that are held in museums. 
And if we, so if we look at the genetic work, it actually suggests that the 15 currently existing uh, or current subspecies of brown bears that we recognize don't really match up very well uh, with what we've learned from the genetics over the past few decades. And in fact, California grizzlies are part of a larger lineage or clade of brown bears, some of which still currently exist in places like Yellowstone, in Alberta, in British Columbia, in Glacier National Park, uh, and elsewhere. So if you think of it this way, then it probably is not completely accurate to say that Cal California grizzly is an extinct subspecies. It's probably more accurate to say that the California grizzly was a collection of populations that is part of a broader subspecies that includes bears in places like Yellowstone, uh, where they currently still exist today. If you look at the range of brown, brown bears worldwide, although black bears are the most numerous, American black bears are the most numerous of all the currently existing bear species, brown bears are the most widely distributed. They live throughout the northwest corner, uh, really, of North America and in parts of Europe and Asia. Population estimates worldwide for brown bears are about 40,000 in Alaska, about 25,000 in Canada, about 2,000 in the lower 48 states. And I think it's important to remember that 2,000 in the lower 48 states is down about 95% from the estimated 50,000 that lived here in 1800, but it's up about 50% from the fewer than 1,000 brown bears that lived in the lower 48 US states in about 1970 or 75. So the numbers have gone up since then, but they're still quite low compared to the historic uh, estimates of about 50,000 brown bears in the lower 48 US states. It surprises some people to learn that there are about 25,000 brown bears in Europe. So there are something like 10 or 12 times the number of brown bears in Europe as there are in the lower 48 US states. And then the, let the rest live in Asia and the Middle East, totaling to about 200,000 or a little over 200,000 brown bears currently alive today. One of the most important things to recognize about brown bears is that they're an extraordinarily diverse and flexible species. They can live in a huge range of environments from deserts to alpine tundra to rainforests, uh, and they do so throughout much of the Northern Hemisphere. Here we have four images, one from uh, Arctic tundra uh, in the Yukon Territory in the far left. Uh, in the bottom left, we have an image of a brown bear in a Mediterranean style ecosystem in Spain. Uh, in the bottom right, we have, of course, Katmai bears, a subspecies of brown bears that live in southern Alaska. And then in the top right, you have a small, scruffy looking brown bear uh, living in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia in Central Asia. Brown bears, I like to think of them as the Swiss Army knives of bears. Unlike uh, a polar bear, which is a knife that's devised for a certain purpose, the brown bear has tools at its disposal that you, it can use in a wide variety of different kinds of circumstances, and it does in the habitats where it occurs. If you start to look at the history of brown bears in the lower 48 states, then what you see is a story largely of decline with some recent rebound. This map shows in light green the presumed distribution of brown bears in the lower 48 US states in around you know, about 1800, a little over 200 years ago. So widely distributed throughout the non-desert areas of the lower 48 US states, uh, west uh, of let's say um, the 100th uh, meridian. And so by about 1900, so by the beginning of the 20th century, brown bear populations were pretty much limited to the areas that you see in dark green. And so their range had contracted dramatically over uh, largely the second half of, of the 19th century. The numbers represented here are either the last credible sightings or the dates of the presumed extinction of brown bears in many of those areas. So as you can see, brown bears still exist in the Yellowstone region. There's no last sighting there. Uh, but in places like California, we do have last sightings. The last credible sighting of a wild brown bear in California was in 1924 on the western slope of Sequoia National Park. California has a rich history of grizzly bears, a rich and well-documented history. Uh, it takes the form of paintings and artwork and uh, historical writings and also uh, material artifacts, including bones that I'll talk about in a little while. Uh, as Mariana said, it's believed that of the 50,000 brown bears that lived in the lower 48 US states, 
uh, prior to the gold rush during the early 19th century, that about 10,000 of those are one fifth lived in California. This painting here depicts what uh, an early Spanish explorer might have seen washing up on shore uh, in a place like San Diego or Santa Barbara or San Luis Obispo, brown bears feasting perhaps on the carcasses uh, of washed up marine mammals uh, or other rich resources that might have occurred uh, along the coastlines during that time. Fast forward in time to the Rancho and Mission eras, uh, and what you see is uh, people recognizing this uh, enormous population of brown bears and living with them in different ways. Here, this is an image uh, painting that's held at the California State Historical Society uh, of a tradition, uh, kind of an ancient Iberian tradition, but one that was brought to the New World uh, of roping, lassoing, hunting uh, brown bears uh, out on the range. Similar uh, kind of related traditions of bear and bullfights that were brought from uh, Roman times and the Iberian Peninsula to areas throughout Spanish speaking North America as far east as, as Louisiana uh, and as far northwest as places like Sonoma. Many of the older cities in California, historic cities, uh, had bear and bullfights, rings, uh, sometimes in front of the presidios uh, where people would go and watch these animals fight. Uh, the bears generally won the battles, but the uh, outcome was never a foregone conclusion. Fast forwarding to the gold rush era, what we see is the brown bear starting to become uh, a symbol of California, a mascot, uh, and also a symbol of the fading frontier as California was brought into the uh, Anglo-American fold, I guess you might say, uh, brought into the United States via statehood. Uh, and the state was being transformed dramatically, politically, economically, and ecologically during that time. By the 1850s, brown bears were being brought into captivity and paraded around in various ways. Uh, this is an advertisement for the uh, museum, which was actually more like a circus, uh, that Grizzly Adams, who was a real person, uh, hosted uh, at his um, at his uh, basement, I guess you'd say circus, uh, on the corner of Clay and Kearney Streets in downtown San Francisco. He had all kinds of animals there. He'd parade them around. He had brass bands. Sometimes they would get loose and run around the streets of San Francisco. And it was really all about, all about the spectacle uh, and the kind of enactment um, of the frontier at a time when it was starting to fade away in places like San Francisco. This is the last uh, California grizzly that pretty much anybody ever saw. Uh, his name was Monarch. He was captured in the mountains north of Los Angeles in the San Gabriel Mountains in 1889 and then brought for a display in San Francisco where he lived in zoos until uh, 1911. Uh, currently, his bones are stored at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at UC Berkeley, uh, in Berkeley, and his skin is stored at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco where curators there are uh, trying to raise funds to refurbish it and bring it back onto the floor of the Cal Academy, hopefully as part of a permanent exhibition discussing the history of these animals in California. So what do we have today? What do we have left of brown bears? Well, as I said, the last credible sighting of a wild brown bear in California occurred on the west slope of Sequoia National Park in 1924. And that was it, then they were gone. And so now what we have is symbols and images and statues and other sorts of things that remind us of the legacy of these animals here, but don't actually provide us with an opportunity to see these animals in the flesh. Here's an example. This is the UCLA Bruin. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. Uh, this is uh, the kind of thing that I see when I look out into my classrooms when we're actually on campus. Uh, people wearing the symbolism of California grizzlies, but not really probably knowing much about them or, or why the grizzly occurs on the California state flag. And then, of course, you know, if we recognize that grizzlies still exist in the lower 48 U.S. states, but not in California, then what we see is efforts to try to bring them back, to conserve them in the places where they remain. And so in the lower 48 U.S. states, there are a series of recovery zones that have been established for brown bears mostly in the Northern Rockies, in uh, the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, the Cabinet Yak, Selkirk and Bitterroot ecosystems, and then a proposed area for a reintroduction or augmentation, if you believe that there are any grizzlies still remaining, in the North Cascades range, uh, which is in Northwestern Washington uh, to the east and Northeast of Seattle. 
So in 2016, um, I founded a group that I've been facilitating ever since based at UC Santa Barbara uh, that was originally the California Grizzly Study Group and then expanded to become the California Grizzly Research Network with the purpose of taking um, a, a new look, a fresh look at grizzlies in California, both to understand their past, but also maybe to think about whether or not they have a possible future in the state. The purpose of our group is to promote through rigorous interdisciplinary research, a more informed scholarly and public discussion about the past and potential future of grizzly bears in California. And we're doing that using a variety of methods and approaches, bringing scholars and students from a number of different fields, uh, as you see in some of these images here, uh, and trying to really cobble together a new kind of story about California grizzlies. It doesn't just treat them as something uh, from the past, dead history, history maybe that's interesting but not relevant to today, but instead thinks of them uh, as having some real bearing on the way we think about nature, ecology, about our state, uh, and about the future of California's environment and ecosystems. I'll also point out that uh, in the bottom left here, that's Alexis Mikhailo. Uh, she was a postdoc. Uh, she got her PhD from Stanford, was a postdoc with us and at the La Brea Tar Pits, and has just begun a faculty position at Middlebury College in Vermont, which is great. Uh, and she's posing there with the boxed up remains of Monarch, uh, who, who you'll recall was the last captive California grizzly. And I have to say, I just think it's perfect that for some reason, someone wrote on the wooden crate that Monarch is currently being stored in, remove this first because there's something about the removal of California grizzlies that for a long time was seen as essential to the, the settlement of the state. Uh, but I don't know if we need to really think about it that way anymore. So one question that might come up is why are we doing this now? Uh, why is this coming up? Why did we decide to launch this project five years ago and why are we continuing with it today? Well, there are a number, number of things that got us interested in this. One was just the increase, increasing recovery of grizzlies in other parts uh, of the world, including the Northern Rockies, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and the Northern Continental Divide around Great Glacier National Park, where grizzlies have bounced back from their lows in the 1970s and are now doing quite well. In California, the black bear population, which is obviously different than grizzlies, um, but is one of our state's large carnivores, even though black bears are mostly vegetarian, uh, has roughly tripled in California, maybe even quadrupled uh, from uh, the 1980s when it was about you know, 10,000 or so to over 30,000 and perhaps as many as 40,000 today. So a dramatic increase in black bear populations in California. Wolves, as I'm sure all of you probably know, returned to California for the first time in 80 years in 2011. Uh, and we now have at least uh, one pack of wolves in the Shasta region uh, in Northern California. In 2014, the Center for Biological Diversity submitted a petition to the US Fish and Wildlife Service to consider listing grizzlies in California and the Southwest as endangered under the US Endangered Species Act and launching a recovery and reintroduction program. The Fish and Wildlife Service did not move on that, but that in a way generated interest uh, and created an opening for our group to do some of the research that would uh, lay the groundwork for a further discussion. Another inspiration for our group is the recovery of large carnivores in Europe uh, and the continuing persistence of large carnivores in areas where people thought they could not remain. Uh, and that includes wolves, lynx, wolverines, and brown bears, which I mentioned earlier from Europe. And so this story from Europe shows that even on a continent that's densely populated with humans and has few if any wilderness areas, large carnivores and even brown bears can coexist with people under the right circumstances. The North Cascades is a model in some ways for how to press forward with thinking about these issues. The North Cascades recovery plan has not been implemented yet, uh, but it has been developed and was completed in 2017. And then although some large carnivores are still not doing too well in California, including mountain lions in Southern and Central California, there is some indication that there is a growing tolerance for large carnivores in many parts of the state, including in areas like Southern California, where iconic individual animals like P-22, the Griffith Park mountain lion, uh, has managed to carve out a living uh, amid you know, a sea of humanity in the second largest uh, city uh, in the United States. And so these are all indications that maybe now is a good time to take a fresh look at brown bears in a place that might otherwise seem an unlikely location to do it. So now I wanna tell you what some of the things that our group has learned. 
And I think I have nine or 10 lessons that I want to uh, talk about here that we've learned, our group, over the past five years. I forget the number because, to be honest, every time I give a presentation on this, I have to add to the list. Our work is still very much in progress, but here are some of the key findings that we've come up with so far. Uh, first, grizzly bears are surprisingly new to California. They arrived in some parts of the state, including, it seems like in Southern California, fewer than 8,000 years ago. That is a remarkably recent arrival in California. If you think of black bears, which probably have lived in California more or less continuously for at least a million years, uh, the fact that grizzlies arrived either with or maybe even after human beings arrived in California in parts of the state, uh, then you realize that they are really uh, a new entry to the state having arrived after a time uh, when many of the Pleistocene megafauna had been driven to extinction. And so here we have some carbon uh, 14 uh, radiocarbon dating uh, data uh, that Alexis Mikhailo, who I mentioned earlier, and others um, have, have uh, completed as part of this project. We have some outlier dates that suggest an earlier arrival, but they're suspect for a variety of reasons. And the oldest confirmed fossil that we have, for example, in Southern California for grizzlies dates only to about 7,000 years ago. And so, so this is a remarkably uh, new arrival for an animal that achieved such a great level of, uh, of abundance uh, by, the, by the 19th century. Second lesson, uh, before 1769, grizzlies lived almost everywhere in California except in its deserts. Here you have two images. The one on the left is a map drawn by the naturalist Seahart Merriam around 1890, depicting the range of grizzly bears in California. He divided them up into a number of subspecies, just the California grizzlies. Uh, he was a famous splitter, not a lumper. Uh, we don't do that anymore. But our group has collected about 400 observations from the historical record, documentary record observations of grizzlies in California, place them to the extent that we can, given the historical records and the information they provide us on maps. And uh, we've, we're using that to try to understand grizzly distribution and habitat use. And so as you can see on the right-hand side, these are most of those uh, dots uh, with some error around them because we don't know exactly where a lot of them occurred, but maybe we know a general location. And so you can see that Merriam's map was, was pretty close to right in some ways. Uh, grizzlies did occur widely throughout the state in the valleys, in the foothills, in the coast ranges, in the transverse ranges, and in the Sierra Nevada, as well as the peninsula ranges further south. Third lesson, grizzlies were not gargantuan monsters. They were not the gargantuan beasts of lore. Most of them probably weighed between about 400 and 700 pounds, which is roughly the size of a Yellowstone grizzly today. There's legend that California grizzlies averaged 2,000 pounds. Uh, newspapers in the 19th century in California said this kind of thing all the time. Uh, Monarch the bear, when he actually was finally euthanized in San Francisco in 1911, uh, weighed about 1,100 pounds, but his bones show significant evidence that he was um, really obese, that he was suffering from arthritis, that he had been overfed and underexercised in the zoo, and it is extremely unlikely that animals in the wild in California would have achieved those kinds of sizes. And so California grizzly bears weren't gargantuan beasts. They were really similar to the brown bears that we know uh, throughout much of North America where they occur and throughout places like uh, Europe and Asia um, today, and probably considerably smaller than, for example, the salmon bears, the Katmai bears. Uh, that currently live um, in Alaska and that you can go and see there fishing for salmon today. Fourth, prior to European colonization, grizzlies in California were mostly vegetarians. After European colonization, they became a little bit more carnivorous. And so we figured this out using a process called, or a method called stable isotope analysis. We found 60, we surveyed the entire world for museum uh, specimens of California grizzlies. We found them in museums here in the state, but also in places like the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC, and even in museums uh, in London and Paris. We were ultimately able to sample 60 museum specimens of California grizzlies and used a process called stable isotope analysis, which is based on the idea that you are what you eat. And so this works for humans too, when you eat food, when you get nutrition from your food, um, elements from that food uh, that contain isotopic ratios um, 
that are defined by uh, the environment uh, and change over time and vary depending on the kinds of food you're eating are incorporated into your body and they remain really essentially forever uh, in your hard parts as long as they're preserved. And so hard parts include things like teeth and claws and bones uh, and to a certain extent, but a little bit less or so, uh, hair right? Because hair grows over a shorter period of time. And so it just tells you what you were eating probably during that time. Anyway, using this process, which combines both museum work and lab work, we were able to determine that before European colonization, grizzly bears in California were roughly 80% herbivorous. We don't know exactly what they were eating, but they were probably eating a combination of roots, tubers, grasses, berries, nuts, acorns, um, and a variety of other plant material that was um, abundant in California's environment, diverse and available year round. After the Spanish arrived and they set their livestock loose on the range without fences, without guard dogs, without people out there watching them, livestock proliferated, many animals died on the range of disease or other, um, or other causes. Brown bears started scavenging out on the range very likely and some of them developed a taste for meat. And so over time, the percentage of terrestrial protein in the diets of brown bears in California, at least the ones that we were able to sample, uh, increased uh, considerably. So it went down from about, uh, so it went uh, uh, down from about 80% vegetarian to about 68% vegetarian, right? So the percentage of terrestrial protein in a grizzly bear's diet roughly doubled from before European colonization to after European colonization. And I'm happy to talk more about that later because it's a really interesting finding and one that uh, we hope will be published uh, in the very near future. Fifth, it wasn't habitat loss that killed off California's grizzlies. It was a small group of people, mostly white men with guns, traps and poisons who did it. We know this from the historical record. Uh, we know this because California still contains plenty of grizzly habitat. I'll talk about that in a minute, potential grizzly habitat. And we also know that where people arrived, even in areas that weren't developed, grizzly bears tended to disappear pretty quickly. And so based on our historical research, we have the last sighting data uh, that we know of at least that we've been able to find by county in California. And so if you look to the right here, what you can see is that the areas of California that were developed first and most intensively, including the Bay Area, uh, at the Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta, and the Sacramento Valley, were among the first areas to lose their brown bears. And so it wasn't just development that was happening in those areas, it was people who were going out with guns, traps, and poisons who were killing grizzly bears, trapping them, uh, and removing them from the gene pool. California still contains, contains plenty of grizzly habitat. And we know this in part just by looking at places like Europe that don't have the kinds of wilderness areas we have at all, but still have brown bears on the landscape, in some cases in pretty considerable abundance. What we're doing to try to figure out exactly where potential grizzly habitat remains in California is to use a few different approaches that we term under the broad category of analogies. So one thing we're doing is we're looking at how grizzlies use habitat in other areas where they currently occur. Some places like Yellowstone and Glacier National Park. Based on models that have been developed there, we can apply them to the California landscape and come up with maps that show us how those models would apply to where grizzlies could live here. Another approach that we're using uh, is we're looking at other related species. And so where do black bears occur in California? Where do mountain lions occur in California? What do we know about overlap between black bears and mountain lions in places like Yellowstone? And how can we apply those insights to try to understand uh, what constitutes suitable habitat, potential suitable habitat for brown bears in California in the future? And then the third approach is that we're using the historical data that I've been talking about a lot already. Where do grizzly bears occur in the past and where might they occur in the future? Uh, based on what we know about how they lived in California. And this is important and a little bit tricky. The reason for that is because if we think about grizzly bears now, if you close your eyes and think about grizzly bears and where they occur, I'm sure that you're imagining uh, high mountain landscapes, remote wilderness areas, cold places, uh, you know, remote shorelines and Glacier National Park, those kinds of places. But historically, grizzly bears also occurred in great abundance in Mediterranean-style ecosystems, 
in California and places like it. We don't have the ability to study that today, so we have to use a combination of studying bears where they occur now and combining that with historical information about what we know about how they lived in these kinds of environments in the past. That's why we're using different approaches, different kinds of analogies to create maps and then figure out where they overlap. If you look at California, then it becomes pretty clear that the best places for brown bears in the future in California would be the Sierra Nevada, would be places like the wilderness areas of the Los Padres National Forest uh, in the southwestern corner of the state, and then to a certain extent in places like the northern coast ranges. It's easier to explain when, where, and how grizzlies could be reintroduced to a place like California than to explain why they should be. And to try to think about this, we've teamed up with a group of environmental ethicists, people largely trained as philosophers, uh, based at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and also based uh, one of our collaborators at Alaska Pacific University uh, up in Anchorage. And so we've been thinking through some of the uh, ethical and moral issues related to large carnivore reintroduction, environmental justice issues surrounding the reintroduction of large carnivores, including things like uh, indigenous rights and sovereignty, and thinking really, trying to think really hard about questions um, related to why and how this affects people and animals, not just the question of whether it's feasible to bring these animals back. That's actually a much easier question to answer, as hard as it is, than to try to understand uh, what's at stake in terms of ethics, in terms of justice, uh, and uh, in terms of this question of why. This was a startling insight for me. Most Californians know little about their state mascot. I assumed that, but this is kind of amazing. And we got this out of a survey we did of a thousand Californians, randomly selected a thousand Californians. Only about 25% of California residents know that grizzlies do not currently exist here. Now, one upside of this, well, two upsides of this, one is that people who don't know a lot about grizzlies don't have strong opinions about them, right? And so in a sense, people are a little bit more open to this than they are to some other issues. Uh, another advantage to this is that it's an opportunity for education. I'm an educator. I know that some of you who are tuned into this webinar are educators uh, either at schools or working as docents um, or serving in other important capacities for uh, organizations like the state park system. Uh, but this is a really uh, um, both a deficit and an opportunity to start a new conversation with Californians who largely don't really know about this animal, about its history, about its influence on our state. Uh, and um, about what might be a potential, a potential future and the right questions to ask and where to even start on a kind of evidence-based um, civil debate about how to proceed. Number nine, everybody loves bears. One thing I come away from this with, no matter who I talk to, is everybody loves bears. And not only does everybody love bears now, but people have loved bears in diverse cultures for a really long time. In many indigenous cultures throughout the world, from Europe to Asia, and also in North America, including here in California, there are many indigenous people who consider bears their literal kin. I remember I was talking to uh, someone uh, not long ago who's kind of a mentor of mine who has been working uh, on environmental issues with indigenous California First Nation groups for many years. And when he told me this, when he said that, uh, that he knows people who think of bears as their literal kin, I asked him what that meant. And he said, you know, I've been trying to figure this out for a long time and I don't have an answer to that, but I also don't think it's the right question. A better question to ask is how would you proceed if it were true? How would you respect that? How would you proceed um, if in fact people and animals have a kinship relationship um, that is beyond science, beyond ethics, beyond democratic decision-making that goes far deeper? And so, People love bears, people are attached to bears, cultures have deep associations with bears uh, around certainly the Northern Hemisphere. But that's one thing, actually living with bears in the 21st century in a place like California or even Montana can be really hard. And societies have to take precautions, people have to take precautions and there has to be real investments in order to ensure that people and bears can co coexist in the places where people live and work and play. 
the final thing I want to say right now, uh, kind of the final lesson that I'm taking away from this, at least at least as of now, at this point in this this journey, is that studying grizzlies in California, or really anywhere else, but but mostly in California, is only partly about bears. It's also about coexistence, which I just kind of talked about a little bit. How do we coexist, humans and other animals, but also people coexisting together with one another? And it's about imagination. One of the biggest impediments to talking about this issue with so many people is that folks just can't imagine what it would be like to have grizzly bears living in a state with 40 million people. It must be impossible. When you bring up Europe, where the population is much more densely, human population more densely distributed across the landscape, and there are way more brown bears, people have resistance and they think it must be, there must be another explanation for it. But in fact, what I think is that talking about grizzly bears in California opens up the possibility for thinking not just about bears, not just about the future of bears, not just about even conservation, but opening up yourself to imagining an alternative possible future that's better than the one that seems like it's right in front of us and that promotes coexistence, that's cleaner, that's greener, and that achieves a lot of different goals at once. And that proves that if you can do one hard thing, then you can probably do a lot of other hard things. This is an image of a grizzly bear in Yosemite National Park. Obviously it's not real. It was created by a friend of mine, an artist named Ethan Turpin based in Santa Barbara, who's been playing with ideas um, like this of reinserting lost creatures into landscapes as ways to open up conversations about what it might be like, uh, a future might be like to actually see those things um, in the wild. So that's what I wanna, what, what I would like to end with uh, but I want to, oh, I want to, <laughs> I want to just show this uh, video in the background uh, because I think it's a really fun one, and it just says so much about about bears. Um, as you might have heard there a second ago, a "Jungle Boogie" by Cool and the Gang is playing in this video. That's just a little something extra. You can go watch it on YouTube if you want. Um, but these are brown bears. This was filmed by um, a remote uh, motion sensing camera or series of cameras that were uh, placed uh, in an area in Alberta, in Canada, uh, to film bears that had been coming to um, a tree to use it as a scratching post. Uh, bears do this for a bunch of different reasons, but the primary reason is to communicate with one another in different ways. So they're marking territory, um, they're communicating about sexual maturity, uh, they're um, communicating about a variety of things that enable them to coexist with one another in the landscape, right? And so um, this is an important part of bear behavior. It's something that happens um, all throughout the ranges of, of brown bears and also black bears. Um, but I think, you know, watching this video, it's cute, it's adorable, it's kind of goofy and funny. Um, in a way, it reminds me of how human-like these animals are in some ways, but it also reminds me of the lengths that other animals, that non-human animals will go to, to attempt to coexist. And so I think that this actually, as goofy as it is, um, provides some really important lessons and some food for thought for us um, as we try to think about how to coexist with them. With that, I'd like to open it up to questions and I think Mariana is going to help moderate that. Yes, thank you so much, that was wonderful. Uh, for those of you that are with us, you can ask questions through the chat or Q&A option on the bottom of your screen. And I will go ahead and repeat those questions to Peter. <laughs> Mariana, are you there? Yes, I oh. am. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm just waiting for questions to come through. It might take a moment for them to oh, type, sure. type it in. Fantastic. I had to keep the volume on on my computer, but turn it off on the on the video. <laughs> <laughs> Unless All everybody right. knows you're cool in the game. <laughs> um, we have a question. Um, how would reintroduction to California happen? And would bears be brought from other places? Yeah, great question. So um, there are there have been a variety of studies that have done uh, been done on how to uh, reintroduce uh, bears to areas um, or translocate bears even to areas where they uh, they haven't existed for a while. 
uh, or just to move them for other purposes. It's a really challenging thing because bears, like a lot of other uh, wild animals, have established um, ranges and moving them can be very disorienting. And it's actually pretty risky because when you disorient an animal out of its uh, established range, then it tends to move around a lot. And when animals move around a lot, it's kind of easier for them to get into trouble and to get hurt, perhaps by wandering onto a highway or wandering into a developed area, or maybe even bumping into an unfriendly uh, other bear. And so it is, it is risky. Um, mortality rates uh, in some cases can be high, but there have been um, uh, there have been approaches that have been developed that have shown a, a lot of promise. So one approach that's been used in uh, northwestern Montana to relocate bears to the cabinet yak and Selkirk ecosystems is to identify uh, appropriate animals who've never gotten into trouble with people, uh, oftentimes young animals who don't really have an established range yet, who are kind of wandering around looking for it. Um, what you do is you, um, you take uh, essentially a, a long, a giant long tube, like a culvert, you attach it to the back of a truck, you bait it, you bring the bears in, they pull on the bait, it slams behind them, you, uh, you tranquilize them, you examine them, and you move them very quickly uh, by truck to uh, the area where you're going to release them. A sort of different approach, but one that can also work um, pretty well, is called soft uh, reintroduction or soft translocation. And what that means is actually moving bears to an area, a bear to an area, and then giving them a chance to kind of adjust within a confined space that they can't leave until they sort of calm down, they get a sense of their surroundings, they learn the smells, and then to kind of um, to release them from there. And so those are some, some alternate uh, approaches and you can read more about them in the literature. Uh, where, would, where would you get bears from here? For here, well, I think what you would want to do is you would certainly want to draw from clade four. So that's the lineage of uh, the evolutionary lineage of brown bears that included California grizzlies. Uh, and you know, also includes animals that still exist in other parts of the lower 48 US states. Right now we have a situation in which uh, areas like Yellowstone National Park, which uh, you know, have been the subject of intensive brown bear conservation efforts for 40 years now, more than 40 years, are really full. The, they're at carrying capacity for brown bears. And the evidence of that simply is that brown bears are now wandering way outside of the park into areas where they haven't been seen in a really long time. Brown bears, grizzlies are being seen 50 miles east of the Rocky Mountain front on the Great Plains in Montana and Wyoming, in part because they're searching for new habitats because places like Yellowstone are full. And so this, I think, actually provides an opportunity both to lessen the pressure on some of those communities that uh, in that area that are experiencing brown bears for the first time and where people are concerned, uh, and also to maybe open up a new area for brown bear recovery in another part of the lower 48 US states, like perhaps the Sierra Nevada. And so that part actually doesn't seem that complicated to me from a biological perspective and even a logistical perspective. The law and the politics of it though uh, is quite challenging and should not be underestimated. Thank you. Uh, kind of going off of that question, um, would it be easier to transfer young bears who are beginning their journey for territory uh, compared to older bears? Yeah, I think that that's right. I think that um, trans translocating older bears is probably not a good idea for a bunch of different reasons. I think that the ideal animals um, for translocation are adolescent animals, young animals that have reached maturity, but that have not yet firmly established their, their home range. And that those are the animals that are being focused on, for example, for translocation from Yellowstone to, to Northwest Montana, to the Cabinet Mountains and the Selkirk uh, ecosystem. And I think that that's shown quite a bit of success. Um, there's a guy named Wayne Caseworm up there um, who has been working on this for 40 years. Uh, and so he's, he's demonstrated that that is a, one of the aspects of this technique that seems to work best. Very nice. And what has been the experience of livestock owners and bears in places like Montana or near Yellowstone? Yeah, sure. That's a really good question. So um, brown bears are pretty bad predators, right? They're in the order carnivora, um, which is a... Uh, um, you know, it's a taxonomic designation, right? Uh, but carnivora includes animals that are obligate carnivores that only eat meat, includes animals that are omnivores, and it even includes some vegetarians like panda bears. 
And so um, brown bears are omnivores that forage for a wide variety of different foods. They can gain a taste um, for you know, livestock um, if they're exposed to it and if they have access. But because they're not built as predators, I mean, they're not pumas, they're not cheetahs, they're not wolves. Um, they, they really are, are not um, very well suited to chasing down, to hunting down prey. And so what that means is that brown bears are potentially dangerous to, um, to calves, you know, for example, newborn um, cattle uh, and older and sick animals. Uh, it's also likely that brown bears scavenge uh, from livestock that's grazing on open range that die for other reasons. Um, so in this way, I think that it's important to distinguish between different kinds of large carnivores. In the United States, traditionally, the way this has been seen is that brown bears, uh, although they do pose some danger to people, and we can talk about that in a minute, they, um, they really don't pose that much danger to livestock. Uh, wolves, on the other hand, pose no danger to people, uh, but they do potentially pose danger to livestock, and so they need to be managed as such. Uh, in Europe, the views on these two animals are, are pretty different, actually, than that, um, so that goes to show you the influence of culture, uh, but I don't think that brown bears should be considered a significant uh, threat to livestock or to ranching operations uh, in the areas where they, where they exist today or where they could be reintroduced in the future. Excellent. Um, how do we help you and others to get the word out to do this for bears? <laughs> oh, wow. Thanks. That's, that's a good question. So I want to clarify something, which is that our group is not an advocacy group. I mean, I'm talking about this enthusiastically because I want people to really think about it. Um, but the ethic of our group has been not to put the answer before the evidence, right? And so we've been working on this for five years. We're not going out and campaigning about this. We're not even advocating a particular position other than this, these are questions worth asking. Uh, having said that, we are working toward over the next few years, and I know this seems like a long way away for some folks, but at the speed of academia, it's kind of not. Um, we're looking forward to, in 2024, the hundredth anniversary of the presumed extinction of grizzly bears in California. Remember, the last credible sighting of a brown bear occurred near Sequoia National Park in 1924. So we're, we've got 2024 coming up. And so we're now in the process of starting to work with partners and plan for this. We're in conversation with the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco to discuss potential um, events or exhibitions uh, that could commemorate this. And that would be a time when we, from an academic perspective, would really have done a lot of the work we could do. Uh, our journal articles will be out. I'm working on a book on this. Um, that will be out, hopefully. And um, they, you know, that would be an opportunity to kind of roll that research out, to start a broader conversation, and then to um, enable other groups to really kind of take the ball and, and run with it if they, if they so desire. And so um, I guess what I would say is we're not quite ready to roll this out to a statewide discussion in the legislature or anything like that, uh, you know, quite yet. But I think from the perspective of the folks in this room, what I would love to do is I would love to see more discussion about this being incorporated into the educational programs that are being offered through California State Parks, for example. Um, we can provide you with a variety of materials for that. We have an education researcher who's part of our team. We're developing more, more stuff all the time. We're hoping to develop uh, other kind of multimedia sorts of products uh, that can be used by educators working um, in, in related areas. Uh, and then to kind of stay tuned as we start to get toward that 2024 date of when hopefully there'll be a much broader uh, discussion about this. The other thing I'll say is that uh, our group does have a website, it's calgrizzly.com. It actually needs to be, I need to get on there and update it um, uh, with some of this information that I provided to you today. But uh, the goal is over the next year or so to really be providing a lot more ma uh, materials on that site that can be used uh, for, educational, um, for educational efforts. Um, I guess the other thing I would say is that our group is um, really committed to not only um, the evidence-based, the rigorous interdisciplinary-evidence-based study of these animals for conservation purposes, but also of fostering um, and nurturing young scholars from diverse backgrounds. And so we have been operating on a shoestring budget up until now, 
uh, taking scraps of funding from wherever we can get it. But what I could really use is if anybody out there is willing to put forth uh, donations to support young scholars from diverse backgrounds who are interested in doing this kind of work. And I'm talking about students um, from, from communities that have been traditionally uh, deeply underrepresented in the conservation community, then uh, you know I would welcome that. We have a fund established at UCSB um, through UCSB Give, and I can provide anyone who'd like it with the, the information to do that. Um, it's uh, you get a, a tax exemption for uh, doing that. It's considered a nonprofit uh, tax exemption, uh, tax exempt donation, and that money would go directly into providing research opportunities for uh, young people from traditionally underrepresented backgrounds to work on this and related projects uh, and hopefully to come up through the ranks to, to really foster a new generation of, of conservationists that can, um, that can really inspire um, a wider constituency for this sort of work. I love that response. <laughs> um, if you could also send me the link to your website, I can help promote it as well. So. You bet I'm happy to do that. <laughs> Awesome. That means uh, I have, have to update it. <laughs> <laughs> update first, then send, send it my way. <laughs> um, have a few more questions. Are you still good to go? Absolutely. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, the next one um, is, is it beneficial to try and resurrect old California bear DNA and somehow breed bears that have that DNA for reintroduction or are grizzly, grizzlies generalists enough that it's not an issue? Oh, that's another great question. So uh, some of you may have heard of Beth Shapiro. Um, she's a well-known scholar um, of evolutionary genetics based at UC Santa Cruz. Brilliant person, um, amazing work. Uh, and she's, um, she's done just incredible projects on a variety of species looking at um, evolutionary DNA to try to understand patterns of um, of evolution, of ecological relationships over time, uh, really unraveling some of the mysteries of the biogeography uh, of animals that we see today, including bears. She's done work on brown bears and polar bears um, and their relatedness over time as well, which is just a fascinating story. Uh, we are working with um, Beth's lab, with students in Beth's lab, to try to develop um, a much larger uh, database of California grizzly DNA um, California grizzly genetics to try to understand uh, both how similar or different California grizzlies may have actually been from grizzlies in other nearby areas such as the northern Rockies or Mexico and so that's one question and then another question is this issue of kind of functional adaptations which is harder to get at um, especially for an animal that has such flexible behaviors um, like a brown bear you know the chances of seeing that in the DNA is kind of low um, especially when you're dealing with DNA that comes in, in scraps, <laughs> right? Um, you know, Beth, Beth's lab um, sampled Monarch. Uh, Monarch was the first California grizzly to have his, um, his DNA sampled. And uh, of the specimen that's at the California Academy, the, the, the material that came back was only about 10% bare. Um, and so that goes to show you how contaminated um, these specimens can become over time. Uh, it's also kind of gross, but we could, I won't even talk about that. Anyway, so um, so the idea is to get more specimens um, and to develop a much larger database so that we can try to answer maybe some of those questions. I think though that it would be a little bit of a mistake to place too much emphasis on the genetics. And the reason for this is that if we look globally at brown bear populations that currently exist in various parts of the world, what we see is we do see genetic differences, but they're kind of mostly cosmetic. Right? Maybe a little bit of size difference, maybe a little bit of shape difference, maybe a little bit of um, other morphology like uh, fur color, things like that. But what we really see is bears thriving in places where people tolerate them and allow them to thrive. And so the genetics, although potentially important, in my view, pales in comparison to the question of human tolerance of these animals. Bears can thrive, even grizzly bears can thrive in places where people will invest the time and effort and resources uh, into tolerating them in a way that can allow them to coexist on the landscape. And so if there's one, you know, one insight I can kind of leave you with today, I think it's really that. I think it's that this is really about, um, it's, it's about us. 
It's about the decisions we make. Um, it's about our willingness to tolerate these animals and maybe have to give a little bit, whether it's money or time or investment, um, to get back um, the benefits of potentially having these animals back on the landscape, which is, I think I believe where they belong. But that relates to the question of why, and as I said earlier, that's a hard one to answer. Yeah, definitely needs a lot of processing <laughs> to answer that question. <laughs> um, what's the main difference between the California grizzly and the grizzlies currently living in North America or North in Northern America? Yeah, I think it's really the answer to that is really um, very little for the other clade four bears. Uh, so again, clade four being the bears that um, currently exist and did exist in the past in Mexico, throughout the lower 48 US states, and into portions of Southern Canada, including portions of uh, places like Alberta and British Columbia. Those bears are very, very closely related to California, to the grizzlies that lived in California a century or more ago. Now, there, there is a wrinkle there, uh, which is that the bears that live in Southern Alaska, in some cases are, are a bit different. Uh, and so the Katmai bears are, are a bit different. Um, they're, they're bigger, they have different habits. They, um, their, their morphology is a little bit different in terms of their um, skeletal features. Um, like I said, they're quite a bit bigger in some cases. And the bears that actually live um, in the vicin vicinity of Admiralty Island in Southeastern Alaska have a kind of unique genetic lineage that's in part a result of their isolation during portions of the Pleistocene epoch, when that, that area was ice-free but isolated from brown bear populations in other areas, but exposed to nearby polar bear populations. And so as a result, what you get is you get this sort of gen unique genetic lineage and history of bears living in this area that today is extraordinarily good bear habitat, right? They're living in very dense populations but that was quite isolated from other brown bears and yet near to polar bears for significant periods of time during the ice ages. And so that's kind of a wrinkle in that story, but it's a wrinkle that's not really quite as relevant for California and for questions of reintroduction. Excellent. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned polar bears because we have a question saying, um, you had mentioned that polar bears and other bear, um, other bears could crossbreed. Are there any offsprings of that cross crossbreed, basically? <laughs> yeah, so um, so black bears are not as closely related to brown bears as polar bears are, right? So black bears are, are a bit different. They branched off uh, longer ago and they, there hasn't been uh, recent genetic intermingling. So you would not find black bears and brown bears interbreeding. But brown bears and polar bears uh, can interbreed. And as a matter of fact, there is now at least one case in the literature of a male brown bear and a female polar bear breeding and producing fertile offspring in the wild. Now, this is a whole story here, right? And this is Beth, Beth Shapiro's work has really uncovered a lot of this from, a, from an evolutionary, evolutionary historical perspective, but I'll just give you a thumbnail. So, First thing you got to know is that the reason I'm saying male brown bears and female polar bears is that if a male polar bear encounters a brown bear, it's probably going to kill him. So you have to, it's, it turns out that it's, it's male brown and female polar bear. And we can actually see that in the, the genetic history, right? So that's one thing. Another thing that's important to recognize is that given that there's actually a history, and this, this oversimplifies it somewhat, but there is a history of these two animals coming together and then branching apart and coming together and branching apart. And one way to think about it, this is again, a little bit simple, but one way to think about it is that brown bears are a diverse species that can do a lot of different things. Polar bears are specialized. And what happens is that in certain times and in certain places, where the conditions are right to produce a specialized animal like a polar bear, you can get a polar bear out of a brown bear, kind of, right? And so those conditions don't emerge all the time. You need um, abundant marine mammals, you need sea ice, you need these things, right? That enable, uh, that you know, 
constitute polar bear habitat. But that's one way to think of it is that the, the kind of parent population is the diverse brown bear doing a bunch of different things. And then the, the kind of offshoot thing is this specialized hyper carnivore polar bear. And so that's from a, a kind of deep, deep history perspective. But one of the other interesting aspects of this is that right now, as a result of climate change in the Arctic, what we're seeing is for the first time, all three species of bears that are in North America, black bears, brown bears, and polar bears overlapping in their ranges. Black bears have always ranged pretty far north, but brown bears didn't usually go all the way up into the deep Arctic, right? But now they are because climate change is enabling them to do so. And so there are some questions emerging about whether or not we're entering into a new phase of this long-term ongoing reciprocal kind of interplay between the generalist brown bear and the specialist polar bear. And that those are questions that only time will tell. That's very interesting. Do we know how successful that pot or that cub was um, that was able? You know, that's to... a good question. I don't, I don't actually know the answer to that question, but here's what I can tell you. Um, hybrids often tend to lose the advantages of either, right? And so if you think about it, like, I mean, just let's take the fact that polar bears are marine mammals, right? They're Ursus maritimus, it's a marine mammal. Um, because they're marine mammals, they have adaptations that make them well suited to living in a marine environment, right? Um, brown bears are not marine mammals, they are terrestrial mammals, and they have a variety of adaptations that make them well suited to living in a diverse terrestrial environment. When you combine the two, what you get is an animal that's not very good on land and not nearly as good of a swimmer or a walker on ice, frankly, right? And so, you know, there are reasons that, that evolutionarily, you know, we produce these, this kind of land generalist and this sea specialist. And when you combine the two, you get something that, that uh, has aspects of both, but is not as well suited to either. And so, um, you know, that's a kind of a general principle. And I think that that is what we see in the cases where, in the, the one case in the literature that I know of, where we have um, the production of, uh, you know, a hybrid uh, in the wild, right, a fertile hybrid in the wild. And I think the same can be said of brown bear, polar bear hybrids that have been produced in captivity. That's good to know. <laughs> but not very interesting. <laughs> um, we have one more question. Um, how, or... Has the Washington Recovery Program been well received and what phase is it in? So, you know, when I look at what's gone on in Washington, um, what I think is that they're, you know, a couple decades maybe ahead of where we are. They started in the 1990s by um, doing studies to try to figure out if there were any more brown bears living in the North Cascades. And so they put out these things called bear hair snares. Um, which is basically kind of like some stinky substance that you put onto something that looks like barbed wire. You attract a bunch of animals to it. They rub against it like the bear uh, on my side here is doing. And then you have hair that you can sample uh, for, for genetics, right? And you can determine the species. And so in all that time that, that those studies were going on, they never got any brown bear DNA off of them. We do know that there, there's brown bear population on the other side, directly on the other side of the border in British Columbia. That one right there is not doing that great. The brown bears further north in British Columbia are doing okay. Uh, and so, you know, we don't know if there are currently any brown bears at all in the North Cascades. If there aren't, you can call it a reintroduction program. If there are brown bears there, then you might want to call it an augmentation program. So building up from a small number that you already have. It took years for North Cascades, and this is being led, this effort is being led by North Cascades National Park. So the National Park Service, so it's federal government. It took years for a park service biologist to develop a, um, a plan for the recovery of brown bears in the North Cascades, even though the North Cascades was listed uh, on the initial grizzly bear recovery plan for the lower 48 US states as a potential recovery zone. And so that plan was only approved in 2017. So it was being worked on during the Obama administration to try to get it over the finish line. When the Trump administration came in, some weird things happened. And some of you may actually remember this from the news. 
But the first um, interior secretary for the Trump administration, Ryan Zinke, um, sort of showed up out of nowhere one day um, at the park headquarters in um, Cedro Woolley, Washington, and uh, stood on the park headquarters without telling anybody he was coming and said that he supported brown bear recovery in the North Cascades and then disappeared and didn't do anything about it. And then the people that followed him said, no way are we doing that. And so it was a, it was a bizarre set of circumstances and events that the result of which was that nothing happened essentially for four years. We're in a different situation now. Surveys have shown that the residents of Washington state support grizzly reintroduction by something like um, three to one, two or three to one. Uh, but let's not forget that Washington state is a largely urban population like California is, and a lot of that pro bear support is coming from the Puget Sound area. And so there are communities close to potential reintroduction sites in the North Cascades that um, are significantly warier of this kind of a management action. And so I think what we're likely to see is for the first time in several years, forward movement on this, on attempts to implement this plan. And you know, the big moment will come when we actually have someone driving a truck with a bear captured in Yellowstone over into Washington to release a grizzly bear. Um, the first one to try to track it and see what happens. Just one other wrinkle I wanna to mention to this. The state of Washington uh, in legislation and a rider on a bill, I think it was a budget bill a few years ago, put a rider on a bill that said that no grizzlies would be brought, brought into Washington state. And this was uh, placed on a bill by a conservative state legislator from the Eastern portion of the state. Um, now the federal government's response to that was the supremacy, supremacy clause of the US constitution says that federal laws uh, are supreme to state laws in cases where those federal laws apply to the enumerated powers in the constitution in any way, it doesn't matter because this is the National Park Service, it's federal land. Uh, but there is a question of, of moving an endangered species over state lines, right? Under the Endangered Species Act. So there's a, there are some legal questions there about that, but I ultimately think that what'll happen is it's very likely that the federal process will, will reign supreme and that a supportive administration will move forward on implementing this plan that has already been completed uh, and signed to reintroduce or augment grizzlies to the North Cascades in Washington. And then I think from the perspective of California, we should watch it very closely. Definitely have to check up on that. I'm curious to see what will happen in the future. <laughs> Me too. So it, you know, yeah. I, I, I have a friend, um, Jack Olfke, who's one of the main, uh, one of the prime movers working for the National Park Service in North Cascades. He's been working on this for a long time and uh, he's sort of a sage of these things. And uh, he said something that really stuck with me. He said, in the grizzly business, patience is a virtue. Wow. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so there are three more questions. It is past 2 p.m. So it's up to you if you want to finish wrapping it up with these last three questions or if uh, I can ask these questions. I'm happy, to, I'm happy to continue for a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first one being with the abundance of black bears in the Sierra, would there be an issue if brown bears were introduced there? Would they get along? Another great question. Would they get along? So you know, for a long time, it was believed that brown bears had outcompeted black bears in Southern California because black bears have been in Southern California for like 800,000 to a million years, maybe more. Um, and then brown bears showed up and then black bears left. Actually, it turns out that that's not right. Black bears disappeared from Southern California about 25,000 years ago and then were brought back in the 1930s. That's a whole other story. Um, but what we do know is that there are plenty of places in North America where brown bears and black bears coexist. Yellowstone is an example. So are a bunch of other national parks in the Northern Rockies and Canada and Alaska. And so in those areas, what tends to happen is that brown bears are bigger, they're stronger, they're, they're better competitors and they're more intimidating. And so they exclude black bears from uh, some food resources in some areas that black bears would otherwise probably like to, like to use and like to be in. And so when you see, for example, brown bears fishing in the salmon rivers of, in Southern Alaska during the salmon runs, you don't see black bears lining up there. 
And that's because black bears are too scared to do it, right? And they'll get driven away by, black, by brown bears. And so what black bears do is they tend to um, look for other resources in other areas that are more distributed that won't bring them into conflict with their bigger cousins. And so this is how they allocate resources. This is how they partition space, if you want to put it in kind of ecological terms. Um, there is a question of whether or not having 40,000 black bears in California, like we do today, is, a, is an ideal situation. Um, you know, is it a good idea to have black bears wandering around Glendale? You know, um, this is kind of an unplanned thing in a way. And I think we're kind of adjusting to it and trying to understand what, what that all means right now. It is possible that in areas where you would reintroduce grizzlies, you could see declines in, in black bear populations over time. But black bears have become so abundant that that might not necessarily be, be a bad thing, right? And so unfortunately, it's very difficult to tell exactly what will happen. But I think a big part of it depends on how successful the reintroduction would be. So in other words, if you had five grizzlies on the landscape, you would not expect much of an impact at all. If you had 500, then you would expect a potential impact and that would be something you would wanna monitor closely. Not to see. Yeah, definitely. And I think if you started off with a small number, you would think that the black bears might be able to adjust as the grizzly population increases. Yes, so you would definitely- maybe it wouldn't be- so. Yeah. You would see changes in behavior, uh, certainly, um, and you may see changes in range, right? Mm -hmm. um, and potentially over time, you could see other changes, uh, such as in diet or in fertility or in things like that. Yeah. You know, and one other thing, too, is that brown bears, um, one of the reasons they're so big is that they're, they're thieves. Um, they engage in kleptoparasitism, which is a fancy word, meaning that they steal uh, animals that others have killed um, or scavenged. And so... What we do see in some areas, like in Yellowstone, for example, is you'll see um, a deer or a moose that has been killed by a mountain lion or a wolf pack. And then a brown bear will come along and scare him away and hog it. And the brown bear will actually sit there for days eating the carcass and then sleeping on top of it sometimes <laughs> um, to keep other animals away. And so kleptoparasitism is an important a way in which um, large intimidating animals can flex their muscles and alter the um, behavior and the success of some other species that actually have to do the work of the killing. Interesting. I haven't thought of that. Uh, that actually kind of goes with the next question, which is, um, do you believe that there would be benefits for other animal species and or plant species of grizzly reintroduction? Uh, this, this was found to be the case for wolves in Yellowstone. Yeah, that's, that's a great one. So I've been, one of our, our Grizzly Group current projects is to try to sort through this and, and see what we can possibly do to, under, to answer that exact question. Turns out to be really hard. But I think what we've, what we've concluded is that whereas wolves, which are really more obligate carnivores, I mean, they, they really are focused on the meat. Um, you know, canines can eat a wide variety of, of foods mostly, but, but wolves are, are real predators. And so, um, because they're, they're, they're real predators, they have a, a significant impact on their prey species, which in turn has a significant impact on the ecosystem. And so what you get is a set of cascading effects that can alter ecosystems in profound ways. You know, mountain lions, if you think about mountain lions, you know, mountain lions in California, most mountain lions are eating a diet where they're getting something like 90% of their nutrition from deer. So that's a significant impact on deer and the extent to which deer alter the landscape, you know, that, that's, that can be potentially significant. Brown bears are different because since they are the Swiss army knives of bears, they eat a wide range of resources, sometimes seasonally. They can be seasonal specialists. So they might be eating salmon during the summer and berries during the fall, you know, and maybe they're, they're eating moths during, the, during another time of year or something like that. And so they're really moving around. They can har harvest a wide variety of resources. And because they have such a diverse portfolio, it's unlikely that they would have such an extreme impact on any one thing that could impact other things. And so it's sort of like dilution, the dilution effect in a way of having a diverse por portfolio and thus not having an enormous impact on any one thing. And so it's likely that brown bears would have a less significant impact on the landscape than would wolves if they were brought back in similar numbers to California, with an exception. 
And I think the exception is really behavior. So brown bears are not good predators, but they may change the behavior of a wide variety of other animals that find it advantageous to avoid them, right? And so if brown bears are altering the behavior of a wide variety of other animals, then how are those behavior alter, behavioral alterations affecting the ecosystem? I think that's really one of, the, one of the big things. And then another thing that's directly related to that is that we can include people, right? So if you have brown bears on the landscape, how does that change how people use it? And so since people are the ultimate keystone species, if humans make even minor changes in the things that they're doing on the landscape, work, play, travel, construction, whatever it is, then that could be a significant alteration that could have uh, ramifying ecological effects. Thank you for sharing. Uh, the last question um, would be, what would the potential for brown bears to repopulate Northern California from populations in the Cascades or Yellowstone populations looking for new ranges like they are on the Eastern side of Montana? Yeah, great. So um, again, we can compare this to, to other species we know, and we can also look at what we're seeing in other areas. And so wolves, if you take wolves, like why, are, why do we have a few wolves in California now? Well, one of the reasons is because wolves move around a lot. They can cover a lot of ground. They're light on their feet. Um, they're, they're prey seeking animals. So they're designed for long distance travel. Um, and so, you know, wolves, it's not surprising in a way in retrospect that they've moved as far as they have uh, into parts of Western North America where they haven't been seen in a long time, just over the last few decades. And, you know, now as of this week, you know, there's a wolf in Mono County. Uh, I'm in Mono County right now. Um, and so I, I think we can expect to see wolves on the outskirts of, you know, places like Sacramento and Denver and Salt Lake City in the not too distant future, right? Uh, and that would bring us more into line with um, cities in Europe, like Berlin, uh, which have wolves on their outskirts. Uh, brown bears are different, right? Brown bears are definitely moving now more than people thought they did in the past, in part because of that density driven thing of there being a lot of brown bears in Yellowstone. And so now more and more going out to try to find new, new territories and new habitats. But brown bears just aren't built for a long distance movement in the way that wolves are. And so their dispersal distances are shorter uh, seasonally and over their lifetimes. And you know, based on that, it's just very hard to imagine, especially given the, the intervening obstacles that they would face, and given the great distance that they are currently from here. It's really hard to imagine brown bears being able to make it to California on their own four feet anytime soon. And so it would require bringing them here. You know, it's funny because a lot of people, I think, look at that and say, well, if an animal comes in on its own, then maybe it deserves to be here and we should conserve it. But if it doesn't come in on its own, then we shouldn't be moving it around. And you know, in a way, cow fish and wildlife has sort of made that decision, right? We're protecting wolves, but we're not attempting to bring in grizzly bears. You know, I think that this is based on a false premise, right? The wolves that have come to California, you know, some of them are wearing collars, they're protected by law, so they're deriving from population that was reintroduced or partly reintroduced. They're they're moving over landscapes that humans have altered tremendously. People have their fingerprint on everything. I think that in the United States, we tend to think that if an animal gets somewhere on its own, it's an entrepreneur. And if it comes in, you know, by conservationists, it's like a welfare situation. Um, and kind of projecting that, you know, ideas about people onto animals in weird ways. Um, it seems to me that bringing grizzly bears back to California is a decision. Allowing wolves to be here is a decision. Those decisions should be based on the best possible evidence. And because of that, that's what our group is really trying to do. We're trying to answer the questions that people, folks on this call, um, legislators, policymakers, people out there who are just learning about this for the first time, would need to answer in order to have an intelligent civil, civil evidence-based conversation about this. And so that's our role. That's what we're trying to do. And um, that's the case whether or not these animals arrive here on their own or whether they would need to be brought back. Excellent. I enjoyed that response. I think that's a huge uh, conversation to have uh, humans influence on animals. <laughs> um, that, 
that was uh, all the questions. I really appreciate you taking the time to educate all of us on this topic. It was incredible. Thank you so much for the presentation. And um, if you have any last words to say uh, before logging off, you could. I, I just, yeah, I just really appreciate the interest. Um, thank you so much for taking the time and for the great questions. Um, please visit calgrizzly.com if you want to learn more. Feel free to reach out to me. My contact information is on there. And if you really want to help us, if you want to support um, our efforts to nurture young conservationists from traditionally underrepresented communities on this project, um, then let me know and we can find ways for you to do that.